And so um, we will get we will get kicked off from here. So so David um, would love to turn it over to you to just give a brief introduction of yourself, um, and and Drake will do the same, and then we'll we'll get into some of the questions. Great. Uh, hey, so great to be here, Josh and Drake. So yeah, quick introduction. Uh, I'm a researcher by background. Uh, about six years ago, I decided to. Uh, entered the blockchain space, and the major reason was because I came across the Nakamoto's white paper. It was a spectacular research paper, as well as a spectacular impact. And uh, so I started a research group at Stanford. I'm also a professor at Stanford. I uh, started a research group there in consensus and blockchain. Uh, over the years, we made contribution to proof of work protocols like Bitcoin, as well as proof of stake protocol like the Ethereum merge. We our team actually worked with Vitalik and his ETH uh, Foundation team on improving the ETH POS protocol before the merge. And uh, so Babylon is the project we started about two and a half years ago, which is basically to combine, to bring the benefit of Bitcoin to the proof of stake ecosystem. So it sounds like an oxymoron, but I'm looking forward to explain that more. Great. Thanks, David. Drake, can you give a quick background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, all, I'm Drake, uh, also at Figment with Josh. Uh, I'm protocol opportunities lead here. So, you know, we, we support 35 to 40 chains, like Josh mentioned today. Uh, kind of primary function of my job is identifying what are the most interesting kind of new opportunities we want to launch on. Um, you know, what's going on in crypto? What are some of these exciting new technological market developments? And, and how do we kind of stay on top of them um, and, and offer, you know, great products around them for institutions? Uh, been at Figment for coming up on a year. Uh, prior to that, was on the partnerships partnerships team at Coinbase and started my career uh, in traditional finance. I was in electronic trading at Goldman for about four years. Great. Thanks, Drake. So, David, I want to kick this over to you. Um, I'm really interested to learn more about the strengths and weaknesses of Bitcoin. Why would you build on top of Bitcoin? What does Bitcoin allow you to do or not allow you to do that that requires you know a different scaling solution on top of it? Yeah, so happy to explain a bit more about my view of Bitcoin. So, um, so in my mind, Bitcoin has two uh, unparalleled strengths. One is the security. Bitcoin is arguably the most secure blockchain in the longest history. Never been hacked. Um, and uh, the security is super important. And we feel that that value is in some sense under underutilized by just using it to secure its own blockchain. So bringing the security to the rest of the crypto ecosystem is one thing that we focus a lot on. Number two is the asset. The fact that the asset is 1.3, 1.2 trillion dollars asset. So this huge size of asset um, could be made more than just a store of value, could be made to be much more useful. And those are the two things we focus on. And do and you think that that, you know, by building on top of Bitcoin, scales more broadly than Bitcoin, some of the core infrastructure changes that they've they've tried to implement over the years. You know, Bitcoin historically grows slowly. There's not that many, you know, it, it doesn't implement new changes very quickly as 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 other protocols do. Yeah, that's exactly the, a good point, is that uh, those two advantages that I mentioned also comes with a disadvantage, uh, which is the lack of smart contract, the lack of programmability of Bitcoin. But in some sense, you know, uh, you can have uh, the lunch and eat it too. The security, in some sense, is uh, strongly correlated with the lack of programmability because the less things you do with it, the less chance it is to hack the blockchain. And uh, so really the interesting middle ground is to how to preserve the simplicity of Bitcoin, preserve the simplicity of Bitcoin, but yet still make it very useful, exploiting these two properties, the large asset and the security. And I think that's a, I think that is a very good way of looking at the value of Bitcoin. So people have, Pride, or there have been projects, there are projects that um, attempt to scale Bitcoin, um, extend Bitcoin's capabilities, make it cheaper, more more easy to, to, to build on top of smart contracting capabilities, et cetera. And some, you know, have, have taken various approaches over the years, like very 
famous one is Lightning, the Lightning Network, the Liquid Network, um, Rootstock, et cetera. What was the inspiration for Babylon? And mm. why is Babylon different than the other initiatives that have tried to extend Bitcoin capabilities to uh, to a second layer? Yeah. So uh, we take a different approach. So you mentioned a lot of uh, very good projects were built on Bitcoin. Um, and indeed, the idea of scaling Bitcoin by building a layer two has been, it's not a recent idea, it's been around for quite a while. Our Rootstock is a very uh, OG project uh, example. And um other projects as well. So the difference between our approach and these approaches is the following. So all, all of these projects you mentioned try to create a whole new ecosystem. Okay. Rootstock has its own ecosystem. It's applications. Our goal here is not to take Bitcoin and try to add a layer two, a specific layer two. Our goal is to use the Bitcoin security to enable existing ecosystems, to enable ec existing ecosystems to thrive. So as opposed to building brand new ecosystem around Bitcoin, we took this approach of, hey, using this um, Bitcoin security to help any proof of stake ecosystems to obtain security, which is the uh, number one important property of Bitcoin. So that's the, sort of the, a bit of a different approach there. Got it. And so David, who might actually be using this? Like, what do you what do you envision kind of like a future world where Babylon is is being widely adopted? How how like what what is that doing for Bitcoin and for other chains? And what is it allowing people to do that they that they can't necessarily do today? Yeah, so maybe I should go into a little bit more detail about what exactly uh, the yeah. Babylon protocol is uh, before I can answer these questions. That'd be great. So you can think of um, if you think about what happens to Ethereum, okay. Uh, Ethereum was like Bitcoin, a proof of work chain for many years. Only two years ago, it has turned into a proof of stake blockchain. Okay. So, what happened is that not only the security model has changed, but something else happened is that once you have this proof of stake primitive, staking primitive of Ethereum, then people will start building other products around it. The first example and the most famous example is probably Lido, uh, liquid staking on top of uh, and other, also several other liquid staking protocols as well. Uh, Eigenlayer, a very recent, but uh, a very prominent example, building restaking on top of that. So you can see that once you have the staking primitive, not only you have a new security model with uh, advantages, but also uh, became like a new DeFi primitive. And so in some sense, what we're building here at Babylon is to give exactly the same primitive for Bitcoin to allow people to have a native staking primitive, okay? Now, the only difference and an important difference is that Bitcoin is a proof of work chain. So we're not advocating that Bitcoin should go through a merge like Ethereum to a proof of stake chain. We're not advocating that. So the Bitcoin security model doesn't change. However, the staking primitive is used to provide security to anybody who wants to launch a new chain, a new roll up, that would benefit from the collateralization of Bitcoin because proof of stake security is essentially a collateralization security. You're collect, you're putting, you're locking some funds to provide collateral to provide security, and we're giving this same primitive to Bitcoin. And um, so our experience of uh, talking to many potential users, going back to your original question, is that. Essentially, anybody can be our customer. And But to give you a concrete example, we started with the Cosmos ecosystem, right? So the Cosmos ecosystem have this very well-established, mature stack called Cosmos SDK. And so many chains actually uses the Cosmos SDK to launch. For example, Barrow Chain, more recent example, uses the Cosmos SDK. Old example, of course, the Cosmos Hub, Osmosis, et cetera, which uh, Figment, I'm sure, is very familiar with. So all these chains who use Cosmos SDK to launch can get our security. And in, in fact, we already have some collaboration with uh, the Cosmos Hub to provide this offering in the Cosmos ecosystem to any consumer chain that wants to launch uh, with Bitcoin staking. Uh, and other specific chains that we talk to is like Akash and Osmosis and so forth. Um, so that's sort of one class of customer. Another class of customer is uh, L2, L2. So lots of roll-ups 
and also lots of rollup as a service. And we're integrating with them to provide Bitcoin sticking to rollups. And the rollup is a very important market for us because, as you know, there are now a lot of new Bitcoin L2, Bitcoin L2 launching. And a lot of them are um, our partners and our customers in terms of getting Bitcoin sticking. Yeah, that, that last one's a great point. And I think we were probably going to dive into it a little later. But, um, you know, something that we see in a, in a lot of these new Bitcoin L2s forming are that, uh, you know, basically getting that the whole reason you want to build an L2 is to have faster transaction times, right? Lower gas fees, just a better kind of user experience. Um, a lot of the, the L2s coming out, are, I think, are, are seeing some challenges with actually integrating with the Bitcoin chain. Um, you know, if I'm building an L2 and I do decide to opt into using some of the shared security from Babylon, my, my hunch is that's going to be kind of a, a much better sort of developer experience. Uh, it's going to be easier to integrate with, right? Like, how would you kind of pitch somebody that's thinking about doing that? Yeah, so uh, typically uh, when you build L2, right, you want to share the security of your L1. That's the whole point of having L2. But yet you want to make sure that the execution can be done off chain. Most execution can be done off chain so that you can reduce the gas cost. So basically that's the design um, parameter of a, for a typical L2. Now, uh, the experience that you mentioned, which is very important, is to have fast confirmation, right? So... Fast confirmation means what? It means that you don't want to wait for Bitcoin to confirm your transaction. So the trick is, how do you get the security from Bitcoin, but not wait for that one hour of confirmation time on Bitcoin chain? You want to confirm like one second, you know? Uh, for example, um, Abitrum confirmation is well known to be sub sub second, sub second. And so you want that kind of performance. And that's where Bitcoin staking comes in, right? So Bitcoin staking basically says that you can take the stick as an asset, you don't have to wait for the L1, the whole Bitcoin to confirm or the miners to confirm, but if you have a substantial asset that is backing up the sequencer, then you can trust the sequencer in the blocks they produce. And so you can confirm immediately rather than waiting for that block to be confirmed on the L1, in this case, Bitcoin. And, and Bitcoin historically takes, you know, 10 to 12 minutes per block. And usually settlement finality is considered after six blocks have finalized. So you're, you're, you're right. You're waiting an hour for a transaction to be considered to be considered final. When you think about DeFi and payments, you know, it's it's really like it's a slow experience. You could you could really, you know, you're not creating a great experience if you're building with an hour settlement time when things need to settle near instantaneously, especially in crypto. Um, so that's really fascinating. Drake, I want to pass it over to you. Um, how do I action, you know, uh, Babylon, right? Like what is, what are, what are kind of the functions that are going to be available to me? Let's assume that I own some Bitcoin. I'm not a developer, but I'm interested in participating in the ecosystem in some way. What does that look like in terms of how I can participate what does, um, you know, kind of the phases of launch look like? What do rewards look like? All those different types of things. I'd be really curious to learn. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Figment's been on Babylon's testnet since uh, I think February of this year, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, so, you know, but well familiar with kind of the, the phases of, of the launch cycle here. Um, you know, I think the mental model that we look at how this chain is launching is somewhat similar to Eigenlayer. I think that's probably fair to say, David. I know you and Sriram share some academic collaboration in the in your prior years. Um, so the kind of initial mainnet launch, which is coming soon, I won't make anybody here commit to a date on that. Uh, but we expect that, you know, if I hold Bitcoin, I want to start opting into the Babylon ecosystem. Um, once that mainnet launches, there's going to be sort of an initial cap of Bitcoin. And I can select a finality provider. So that's someone like, a, you know, Figment, kind of a major staking infrastructure provider. Uh, and I can stake my Bitcoin, you know, through their finality provider node. Um, you know, in the meantime, we don't expect there to be kind of initial rewards. This is going to be kind of testing out some of the uh, functionality on mainnet, testing and fraud, so to speak. Um, maybe some sort of points accrual system. And then, you know, later down the line, um, some of those caps we expect to start to lift. Uh, more of the actual battle on chain itself, which, you know, as David was describing, is a Cosmos SDK chain. Um, we kind of backed by a, a BBN token. Um, and then, you know, consumer chains getting built on top of that later. So sort of like, like I said, if if, if we're comparing to Eigenlayer, uh, the initial launch was I can deposit some ETH. 
uh, you know, for a point system. Uh, later on, we saw this kind of proliferation of teams like liquid restaking tokens, AVSs, all kind of come to fruition upon this initial base of, uh, you know, security from the base asset. So Bitcoin instead of Eigen this time. Um, you know, as for rewards and kind of how those payouts work, uh, given a lot of this is living in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, you know, I think uh, you can kind of expect a lot of that will be going to a Cosmos address you're providing, you know, something like a Kepler wallet initially, um, you know, with a lot of the larger qualified custodians having big, big time interest in the Babylon ecosystem and, you know, supporting institutional customers uh, staking. Um, you know, other considerations we have that we always get with new chains, uh, how does slashing work, right? Um, you know, I think Babylon has a lot of unique kind of functionality for how slashing will work on, on the actual Bitcoin chain. This might be something we'll get into a little bit later, but, um, you know, generally the finality provider can be slashed for things like double signing a transaction or, you know, kind of committing some of these more malicious behaviors on chain or you just being a bad kind of operator, not having uptime. Um, punishment for rewards on that side of the thing, the house. And then, yeah, the actual slashing on um, Babylon is kind of through this really unique cryptographic function called extractable one-time signatures that more or less kind of exposes um, a private key when, when some of these slashing behaviors are committed and, you know, anyone can kind of come in and, and uh, access that address using these release private keys when that happens. Yeah. So, um, Maybe just one uh, is an excellent summary, but maybe I just add one or two points, Please. if I may. Um, yeah, so um, uh, number one is that the Fanatic provider, I should say, is a very modular design. So our, our long-term vision is to allow these Fanatic providers like Pingman to run not only on Cosmos chains, but on any proof-of-stake chains and uh, any proof-of-stake systems. So that's number one. The Fanatic provider is kind of like a modular add-on to existing validation infrastructure. And uh, so it's a very lightweight add-on. So I think that's the, one of the design that I want to point out. Um, number two is the slashing. Um, we understand that slashing is kind of something very sensitive to a lot of people, right? Slashing sounds pretty bad, right? Sounds like, whoa, some corporal punishment or something like that. So our design, our design, very important design is that we only support slashing conditions that is already well established in proof of stake ecosystem. So Drake mentioned double signing. And in fact, double signing is the major, the main slashing condition that's already supported in many, many proof of stake chains. So operators, uh, validators, uh, fanatic providers have already a lot of experience with this uh, slashing condition. And so we're hoping because of all this experience that this slashing, just like historically, will be very, very rare. It will only due to sort of really malicious operation and not due to um, uh, some, so the experience uh, in the past history uh, gives us a lot of confidence in implementing these slashing conditions. Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like um, you've gotten to see some of the lessons that other proof of stake chains have undergone with, with you know, adding staking functionality. I feel like when the, when the merge was happening on Ethereum, there were so many questions about slashing all the time. And um, you know, really the experience should feel pretty similar to staking on any other chain. That's kind of what we've been seeing on testnet as we're playing around with some of the product features we've been adding. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't feel yeah, so, too different for a staker. Yeah. So there's a famous, I don't know who said it, but there was a famous thing, statement say that all blockchains are testnets for Bitcoin. <laughs> all blockchains are testnets for Bitcoin. So this is a very extreme statement, but I, in some sense, there's some truth to that because what we're doing is we're bringing in the experience, we're bringing the experience with proof of stake ecosystem in the past uh, few years and bringing it, it back to Bitcoin to provide this kind of functionality. So in some sense, our protocol is designed with all this experience in mind, this proof of stake experience, but taking into account the constraint of Bitcoin, which is the lack of smart contract. And that's why this technology that you mentioned, extractable one-time signature was needed essentially to compensate for the lack of smart contract because in a proof of stake chain, typically the slashing is uh, is done through a smart contract. Uh, but in Bitcoin, there's no smart contract. So we need to do a few cryptographic tricks to enable the same, exactly the same level of security to the proof of stake chain. But at the back end, we need to do more to do the slashing on the Bitcoin chain. So a very important point I want to emphasize is that your funds, the stakers fund, the user experience, right, that you mentioned, the funds is always on the Bitcoin chain. There's never any bridging of asset 
to the Babylon chain or to the Babylon tre treasury or the Babylon foundation. No, all the funds are in a self-custodial manner staked on the Bitcoin chain in terms of a UTXO transaction. And the slashing is basically saying that if something bad happens, then a certain percentage of that fund will go into a designated address. So very important is that the fanatic provider cannot also go and steal your money at uh, this delegation. So, you know, Drake, um, so delegation is actually quite a tricky issue to explain. I'm sure uh, Figment has a lot of experience explaining to the user, but delegation is not the same as giving funds to a custodial of, say, Figment. Very important, very important. Figment is only in, in charge of providing security to the proof of stake chain. Yeah, when you guys mentioned um, the extractable one-time um, signature, we got a lot of questions in the comments about people, you know, having some general concern around having their private keys exposed and how much risk they would be at if, you know, some if something were to happen, there was a slashing event, is their entire Bitcoin stack um, at risk? Can you can you talk about maybe like risk limitations and slashing and, and kind of how the penalties would be imposed so that a user's user, you know, we can give some of the potential future users um, some some clarity on how that would operate? Yeah, so a very very important point, right? I um, very important. Uh, so I want to emphasize is that the slashing can only happen if the finality provider double sign. Okay, so if the finality provider is doing its job, then there should be zero slashing. And very importantly, this is exactly the same interface to the proof of stake chain as in existing Cosmos chains, existing Ethereum. Exactly the same. If a validator on Ethereum double sign then the sticker will be slashed, okay? So that is that is the same, exactly the same. So the risk here is not more or less, it's the same. Now, in terms of uh, how much of the Bitcoin is slashed, okay? So this is a parameter that we can specify, We meaning our protocol, the users can specify on the sticking contract, okay? And this parameter is usually a result of the governance of the chain. So a typical Cosmos chain would have some kind of parameter like 5% slashing. So if there's a double sign, then 5% of the fund will be slashed. Mm -hmm. So here, the same thing, 5% of the Bitcoin will be slashed. Gotcha. That's helpful. Thanks, David. In terms of, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, and, and we sort of started talking about this a little while ago, but um, I guess like, what types of partnerships are you guys forging? So I really want to think about the ecosystem and how the ecosystem will mm. grow. And obviously there's there's the kind of two sides of this, right? There are the suppliers of the Bitcoin, then there's the the projects that the that the stake is going to be used to um to to to, to fortify. How do you think about yeah, the, the right. ecosystem growing? Um and, and what sort of partnerships yeah. are you guys forging? Um that'll be you know helpful to the growth of the project over time. Yeah, I think that is a great way of looking at our protocol. It's a two-sided marketplace. On the one side is the supply of capital, supply of sticking capital. On the other side is consumer blockchains that consume the security, consumer security, blockchains, roll-ups, et cetera. So to grow the ecosystem, we have to work in both directions. So I'll just give you some examples of the type of um, projects that are building on the Babylon yeah, ecosystem that fits, and I use these two supply and demand to categorize them. So in the, on the supply side, very important partners are LSTs, okay? Liquid Staking Protocol. So I mentioned earlier that what happened when ETH staking came online, what happened? The first thing that happened, one of the first thing that happened is LIDO, right? Is Liquid Staking Protocol. That essentially says that, hey, security is good, but liquidity is also very important. And so let's have a product where you can leverage the locking of the funds and add liquidity on top of that or keep the, uh, retain liquidity. So there are a, at least 10 LST protocols, 10 LST protocols building on top of Babylon right now. So these LST protocols take funds and then they, um, very similar to kind of um, uh, liquidity, provide liquidity receipt and mint it on certain chains that are of interest. So that's one side. Another side is um, a wallet. So we're integrating with quite a lot of wallets. And wallets are very important for us because wallets allow us to reach to 
uh, particular retail users, retail users who use this wallet. So that's another side. Uh, three is custodials. Custodials, uh, we've been talking to multiple custodials. Uh, so these discussions are still in progress right now. So I don't think I'll name specific names here mm. in this um, chat, but uh, they're very well-known custodials. And they're very interested in integrating with us to allow their customers to stick with the funds, with the funds in the custodial service. And um, that is a very important for us also because custodial is also a way for us to reach institutional institutional stakers because the institutional stakers, of course, they use custodial services. And so that's one direction. Um, on the uh, on the demand side, number one thing very important for us are Fanatic providers. So we mentioned Fanatic providers are the ones who are actually uh, provide the staking service, right? They're providing the staking service. They're securing the chains. So we've been talking to many, many Fanatic providers and like Figment and other ones. Hey, maybe I should not mention your competitor, right? So let me not mention other other people's names, but they're they're very well known. All right, can I mention a few? okay like Please. p2p for example p2p p2p is also a, 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 our strong supporter they wrote a very nice um, blog article on the protocol to explain to their um, community and uh, so fanatic provider is a very important partner for them for us because they are in some sense have one foot on the supply side one foot on the demand side on the supply side on the supply side uh, they help us to attract funds from the existing customers. The existing customers used to stake the altcoins like uh, Cosmos or uh, Atom or something. But hey, these guys also have Bitcoin. These guys also have Bitcoin typically, right? Everyone has Bitcoin. And so this is a new product, but for the existing customer base. So it's very important. And on the demand side, financial provides very important for us because they will also help us in passing governance proposals to integrate Bitcoin staking with these consumer chains. And uh, so uh, very important partners for another providers. Now, uh, I already mentioned in terms of specific consumer chains like Cosmos Hub, uh, Osmosis, and Akash, these are the chains that we've been talking with. Uh, we're also talking to other ecosystems as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's where we are. Great. It's so a friendly reminder, the Q&A button is live at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to go ahead and, and answer some questions or ask some questions. We'll roll through those in a minute. Um, but I first have a fun question that I want to ask David and Drake. And um, Drake, you know, and David, we've we've heard a lot about um, the potential presidential, a potential presidential candidate thinking about making Bitcoin a part of the U.S. strategic reserve. Well, that's a would be a major supply opportunity for something like Babylon. How would you go ahead and convince the U the U.S. government or a Bitcoin ETF or um, a, a Bitcoin miner or someone who holds a large amount of Bitcoin that they should be thinking about supplying their Bitcoin to through the Babylon pr uh, protocol? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Um, so. You know, uh, uh, our main product, right, is a security product. So security is number one for us. And that's why we insisted on designing a trustless protocol, okay? So a very important thing is that in our protocol, I want to reemphasize, right, there is no third party custodial, there's no third party committee to run this protocol. So the trustless nature means that you cannot get better security. You cannot get better security than that for the sticker. And that's why we think that on the long run, on the long run, this will become a very important product to for institution. Of course, the biggest institution is the government that you cannot get better, bigger than that. Uh, so we believe on the long run, having a yield, having a yield on the Bitcoin held, even if the yield is very low, like 1% or 0.5%, it's a game changer, it's a game changer. Now, to get to there, we are also very conscious that there will be many steps, there'll be many steps because we are a new protocol. It will take us a long time to educate and to prove ourselves to be a really secure protocol. But we believe the fundamentals of the protocol is good. So we believe step-by-step step we'll get there. So we are not thinking like next month we have Bitcoin ETF issuing uh, ETF with sticking yield on Babylon protocol. No, but 
we will get there. And uh, so that's how sort of thinking on this uh, line of question. Great. Do you th do you have anything separate? I, I I changed my background to to be a pure Bitcoin maximalist background. So I need you to convince me. I'll play the role of Bitcoin maximalist. Why I should be considering staking my Bitcoin via Babylon? Yeah, yeah. I think I have kind of two major points. Uh, the first one is just. If I am a treasury manager, if I am, you know, in a kind of fiduciary role with a, you know, an existing portfolio of Bitcoin, whether that's coming in through an ETF, a strategic reserve, or I've just, you know, bought and, and hodled over the years, um, you know, I think at a certain point, you, you do have kind of a fiduciary duty to look at what else can I be doing with this, right? I, I think, you know, everyone here, not financial advice, but we're, we're probably bullish on the long term future of Bitcoin and, and this, this whole industry. Um, but in addition to just pure price, speculative price appreciation, I think having some sort of a passive uh, rewards on top of that is extremely attractive. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of the, the first pillar I would look at is just you, you do, I think over time as Babylon gets more proven and battle tested, this is going to be a, a stable, uh, you know, additional reward stream for my portfolio. The second thing I would think about is... Uh, you know, we've, we've seen ETFs launch. We saw the Bitcoin ETF launch earlier this year. We've seen the Ethereum ETF launch. Um, you know, we're recording this beginning of August, just, just a week or two ago. Um, I think what I've been interesting, what's been interesting to see is sort of the narrative around Bitcoin and Ethereum that have been getting sort of pitched to the mainstream audience, right? And I think Bitcoin has this sort of very, you know, rock solid digital gold store of value, uh, when things get crazy in the world, I buy Bitcoin. Um, while Ethereum has more of this um, kind of tech story, right? This is the app store for the, the next version of the internet. This is a growth play. All these cool new things getting built on top of um, smart contracts, decentralized finance. All this is kind of like a, you know, but getting Ethereum is sort of a proxy for this new ecosystem. I think Babylon is a way of bringing some of that growth tech story and narrative over to Bitcoin, right? So I think there's no reason that you can't have both uh, in the BTC asset. I think about, it's really interesting, right? If you if you wanna own Ethereum and participate in the network security, you don't need to own anything other than Ethereum. You can stake your Ethereum, you can earn rewards on it. You can't do that with Bitcoin today, right? If you wanna participate and earn rewards on top of Bitcoin, you have to buy, effectively, you have to buy a Bitcoin miner a stock and you have to hope it pays a dividend. Then you have price exposure to the, um, to, you know, energy prices, to ASIC production, to things that are way outside your control. Um, there's so many macro factors that influence that. So I think this is going to be this, this, there's actually a really strong, compelling narrative here for large Bitcoin holders, large treasuries, et cetera, who may want to diversify the way that they can earn rewards on top of their Bitcoin, um, not have to purchase, you know, a, a, a you know a high cap capex, you know, low revenue based stock, and and look at something like like just owning the Bitcoin outright. I think that's really interesting. Um, maybe future way that that larger firms or or you know kind of macro oriented trading firms will start looking at this again. Not financial advice. Um, now to, to I'm going to dig into the questions. There's one or two I think that are interesting um, that we can that we can we can discuss. The first one is more of a simple question. Um, how someone holds Bitcoin today? Can you just very simply walk through the process of staking on Babylon? I mean, I think I think we know you know it's we're we're in the process of going live. We're not 100 percent there yet. But what what will it look like? You know how how would you walk? someone through um who owns bitcoin how to stake it yeah so when our mainnet launch um in fact we are as you mentioned we already have a testnet running for a few months uh, the mainnet will be uh, similar to the testnet so there will be an interface um, and someone with a wallet say okay x wallet or binance uh, trust wallet they will have some bitcoin in the wallet they will plug the wallet uh, you can say web wallet they'll pl plug it into our ui and then a transaction a transaction will be sent from the uh, wallet to the bitcoin chain to the bitcoin chain another address that address is self-custodial address and it'll be locked 
it will be locked for some period of time. Locking is a very important property, right, of staking. Because if you don't lock your funds, then you're not providing any security. And um, so that is basically the interface. So the, the very importantly, the, inter, the, the interface is entirely through a connection between your wallet and the Bitcoin chain, okay? So our UI, we have a UI we're going, we're going to launch, is for convenience. In fact, you don't need to use that UI. You can directly go and interact with the Bitcoin chain Send that transaction up on the big chain. That's also fine. Uh, so I think very importantly is that we never hold any of this Bitcoin in any third party. So I just want to re-emphasize that because I think that is quite important, particularly for Bitcoiners who have been burnt before in the past of trusting third party um, custodial and losing uh, the assets. So we uh, just want to emphasize this aspect of our product over and over again. And David, uh, there is a question on here. I don't think we we do, we do have too deep into this, but what units will that staker earn their rewards in? Um, will they earn it in Bitcoin? Will they earn it in in a separate token? Will they earn it in the token of, that they're providing chain security to? How does how do the like what token will will they ultimately earn? Yeah. So um, on the long term, right? On the long term. Uh, when the Babylon ecosystem is grown to the full stage, then there will be many proof of stake chains, but many roll ups, all consuming security. And the staker, when they deposit, when they stake, when they deposit into the staking contract, they will also pick. They can also pick chains and finality providers that they want to stake to. So there will be a whole menu of list. Okay. Now, each chain will have their own way of generating yield for the staker, okay? The yield could be in the native asset of the token. So, for example, in the case of Cosmos Hub, I think that was an example I used, Atom is the native asset. And so Atom will provide a fraction of issuance from the issuance to provide yield to the staker. Now, it could be, though, there was another blockchain, for example, that runs a stable coin. And the yield could come from the stable coin as providing yield. So the way of thinking about security, right, is that there is an economy. You're supporting, you're securing a blockchain, which is like a country. That country has an economy. It's doing something, hopefully, useful. Because of that, it generates fees. And that kind of fees can provide, part of that can provide for the security and that's the, the way of thinking about security. So there's no single universal answer, the single no single universal answer to what denomination that yield could come in. Now, of course, there will be other uh, um, uh, ecosystem participants which will do some swapping service for the sticker to swap the native asset to back to Bitcoin if that's the preferred uh, asset denomination in which the yield is returned. So that's another possibility. Uh, but I think uh, one very important point I want to emphasize, which I did not, is that um, because Bitcoin is such a universal asset, you could expect that many blockchain can be uh, secure using Bitcoin, right? So right now, you would not expect people would use ETH to go and secure Solana, right? That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. However, you, would, you could imagine a world where Bitcoin is like a universal staking asset. It can be used over a wide range of ecosystems. Why? Because all ecosystem wants to have some alignment to Bitcoin, either through security or liquidity or both. Okay, And so therefore, Bitcoin actually not only provides the value of staking, it also provides the value of restaking. So now I bring in a new concept. This concept was, of course, pioneered by Eigenlayer this notion that you can do restaking. So we built the Bitcoin staking primitive, but then we can add this restaking on top of that as well. And so now we can earn yield from multiple chains as well, the sticker. Thank you. That's great. I think final question, Drake, I'm going to pass it over to you and just kind of, you know, I think we have a lot of Figment customers and users um, on this call. Can we just, can you quickly walk through, you know, when folks will be able to to um to to stake their Bitcoin via Figment, what that experience will be like, um, and anything else that you want to share about Figment's journey and supporting um this this uh this exciting new protocol. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll leave the win question to David. Uh, that's always the first question we get in any of these things, right? You know, win token, win whatever, right? Um, so, you know, we'll share that as soon as it's ready. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, our product team has been doing a ton of work the last few months on spinning up click to stake functionality, um, APIs. You know, we, we've been working with a number of, of large qualified custodians. So, you know, as soon as Babylon mainnet does go live, you'll be able to go directly onto Babylon's site, um, their Explorer, select Figment's Fidelity provider, stake your Bitcoin to us. Um, but we'll also have a number of offerings for, you know, sort of institutional folks where their Bitcoin is sitting in qualified custodians uh, working on integrations there uh, with that sort of click to stake functionality. So, you know, it should ultimately feel very similar to staking with Figment on any other chain that we support today. Um, as far as the experience, like I said, testnet has been smooth. Um, you know, it's been great getting to know some of the Babylon team as, as we built, um, you know, our, our offering up. Um, they, they provided a number of great resources for building out some of the APIs, UIs, all that, that, uh, you know, we're going to have live from day one on mainnet. Awesome. So, David, if folks want to learn more about yourself, the project, um, progress, where can they where can they go to learn more about that? Yeah, the website is the babylonlabs.io. Uh, Twitter handle is uh, the same, so I think both you can get very log. So the lab, the website get a lot of uh, uh, videos, blog, podcasts, etc. to explain the protocol. We also have some blogs, and the Twitter we um, send updated information about the project. Great, and we are figment.io and at figment on Twitter. Um, and follow us as well to learn more about exciting updates. And we're excited to share the journey with you all as we continue to go forward and, and explore Bitcoin layer two staking. Thank you, David. And th thank you, Drake, for joining us today. This was fantastic. Thanks everyone for joining. George, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, Drake, very right. happy to be here with you guys. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye y'all.